Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My task is to discuss in the next six minutes what's the future of robot-enabled shoulder arthroplasty, and that is some of the disclosures they are relevant because I work with Stryker and Mako in the development of this tool for shoulder arthroplasty. So what defines a robot? A robot is essentially a device that you can program and will perform one or more tasks. So a very simple way to think about it is an intelligent effector where if you provide input or the robot has perception of something, it will actually do something, an action. And if you think about it, why is it that humans in general have adopted robots? Two main reasons, either because a robot can work relentlessly, so that's the reason in industry where you can be making cars 24 seven day and night, or because the robot can do things that we humans cannot. And that comes in three categories, either they are more accurate or precise or both, or they can go faster or stronger than a human, or they can work in an adverse environment, for example, a toxic field or something to that extent. In orthopedics, the reason is gonna be, I think, that they are more accurate and precise than the human eye and the human hand. And there are three facts that I think are important to recognize. Number one, today we have data from the hip and knee literature that robots do improve outcome, we know that. Number two, it's important to recognize that all robots are different and some quote-unquote robots may actually not be robots if you stick to the definition. And then we have to understand if we can apply the principles of robotic-enabled surgery to shoulder arthroplasty. So I will divide my talk in three sections. How are the robots doing their process and abilities? I will use the uni knee as an example, and then I will kind of dive into the future in shoulder arthroplasty. So essentially, as we talked about before, a robot is a combination of programming or input and action. And in joint replacement, the robots will have a software, and then we can input essentially three different inputs. Our pre-op planning, which we all know about very well today, transferring the anatomy with registration, and in some cases, smart sensors. And this is where you have to pay attention because some robots are based on CT scan, some on x-rays, some are actually imageless. In terms of the action, it depends on what the robot can do with the arm, so the arm may have one, two, three, four, or five, or six degrees of freedom. And also, what's at the end, interestingly, some robots don't have a cutting tool at the end. They position, but they don't really cut. Some others use a burr, or a drill, or a saw, or a reamer. And then you have to also understand how is it that this is done. There are some robots that are completely automatic. There are some manual, most common, are done in a semi-automatic fashion, and the big word here is haptic boundaries because that's what really explains what is the semi-automatic feature of the robot. And this table is very difficult to read from where you are probably, but it basically shows how every robot is different. So as you start to think about how you will incorporate this into your practice, you have to pay attention to what's the input, what is the effector tool, and so on. Where do they fit in what we're doing today? Where we're in a journey now, we master planning, we don't master execution. And we've made some progress with PSI instrumentation, we have navigation, we have augmented navigation, and then the robots will either position uh, or will actually prep the bone, and we already have examples with uh, different companies working on in different ways to improve from plan to execution. Let's think about the uni knee as an example. Basically, in the most commonly used robotic knee, uh, application, that is the effector arm, you have a camera and a console for your uh, robot specialist. We know very well as shoulder surgeons about planning. In terms of execution, it's basically three steps. You have to tell the robot where the anatomy is, so that's called registration. Then you actually can check for soft tissue, which I think will be extremely important and useful for shoulder orthoplasty surgeons, and then you execute. That's basically it. And this is just a very quick video clip that shows that this is a little bit of a change of the way we do things because most of the robots that are working in a smaller space, like the glenoid, or maybe just one condyle of the femur, they don't use a saw. Uh, they actually use a burr, and that has some attractiveness, I think, for us in the future. And if then you combine that with the power of smart sensors, now you have a robotic arm that can actually move things in a space and can receive real-time input from sensors. These sensors have been already used by one company in reverse of and I think they want to expand everywhere as we move into this uh, field. And there is a lot of evidence, you know, uh, this is for, again, Unini, and you can see how multiple studies have proven that robotic arthroplasty improves the overall position of unicompartimental knee arthroplasty. That leads to faster recovery over time and much improvement survivorship at 10 years. So I think we're really learning from our hip and knee colleagues, and in my institution, almost every knee surgeon now uses a robot of different styles. So how will this translate into shoulder arthroplasty? Well, think about what we're trying to achieve in the shoulder. What we're gonna do is get a perfect humeral cut. Why? 
because stemless and short stems are not self-aligning. So I see more mistakes now in arthroplasty on the humeral side because of the nature of our designs. And of course, we want to have a super perfect accurate glenoid preparation. We're trying to get augments within the millimeter and within the degree. But we're also very interested in soft tissue management, like Dr. Masoka just talked about, subscapular extensioning, for example, soft tissue tension in reverse arthroplasty. And think about the power of a burr. If you can get a burr to do the work, you don't need to have a straight access to the glenoid. So those patients that are really difficult to expose because you need a 52 rimmer to go in there, you don't need to do that. And you could possibly sneak the burr through the interval region. And I think this is just genius, and I think it's going to revolutionize the way we do it. And I think it will be adopted because for us, shoulder surgeons, CT scan is our second nature. There is more than 1,600 robots already in the United States. They can prepare the bone for you. They will give you soft tissue assessment and possible calf preserving arthroplasty. And of course, there is also a marketed element. So in summary, I think that some shoulder arthroplasty systems will allow you to have a perfect execution, including soft tissue balance. We know that in the hip and knee, clinical outcomes are better with robotics. Hopefully, shoulder will follow. I think this really opens the window to a true calf sparing shoulder arthroplasty, but of course, the devils are in the theater because not all robots are the same, and actually, some are actually not robots. Thank you very much. Joaquin, can you, can you Thank go you, back Joaquin. to the slides? Hey, uh, Paul, Paul, we're going to go in reverse order. We're going to go in reverse order. You, you, kind, of hogged, you kind of hogged the mic last time. Uh, Bob, Looks why don't we start with you? Um, and only question, uh, what's the timetable? What is the timetable? Yeah, for us to see this in... So, I actually don't know for sure because that's all proprietary information by each company. I estimate two to five years, okay. but that's just an estimate. I actually don't know for sure. It's, it's interesting, Bob, during, during my presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I sent out a bunch of emails to uh, business leaders in the industry to ask about specific timelines, and uh, I think one of them responded. None of them responded. I guess they don't want to share their pipeline. Great talk. Yeah, great talk, Joaquin, on a, on a difficult topic since it's so new and cutting edge. Uh, my question is about you stating that the robotic hip and knee literature shows better outcomes. So I'm not a hip or knee surgeon, haven't done one since I was a resident, but I ask our residents that rotate with me, you know, what's the current state of the literature on robotics? And all I hear from them is it hasn't been demonstrated to be better maybe in some alignment radiographic studies, but clinically in terms of range of motion and pain relief and satisfaction, I'm told that there is no advantage to a non-robotic knee, is that? So in my institution, there is six high-end users of robots, and they're very involved in research, all of them. And what they tell me is that for the uni specifically, outcomes are better, meaning that patients have faster recovery of motion, and it probably has to do with a less exposure that is necessary, and also they get a prescriptive element all the time. For total knee and for total hip, I think you are correct. No one has proven that there is better outcomes clinically. So I just use the unini as an example, but you're correct. Not for total knee or total hip as far as I know. I would have your residents start reading too. <laughs> they do. They're good residents. But they're right. So, so uni knees may be better, but total knees, total hips, there's no evidence that... Yeah, that's why in the shoulder, if we were able to sneak the birth through the interval region, I think that would be a game changer. You know, if you don't have subscapularis, maybe it doesn't really matter. Mike, what's your rating? What's that? What's your grade? What oh, is your grade? grade? Uh, 9 out of 10. 9 out of 10. Bob? 9.5. Zumi, you're up. Yeah, so it was for me an extraordinary talk, 10 out of 10. And uh, the only question what I have to you, Juan Keen, is that in t we have already some problems with precision in terms of automatic or manual segmentation and also the planning and transfer this planning which is about two to three degrees or two to three millimeters. What do you think, what, can you tell us what the error of the robot itself is in terms of the precision? So I don't think that we know that for the shoulder at all, you know. For, for knee and hip applications, the robot probably will have a, a range of one to three degrees and one to two millimeters probably. I don't know for sure. But something that you point out that is very important is that when you are doing all these processes, you potentially can accumulate errors, right? So if your segmentation is wrong, and then your robot has some deviation. You may get, you know, maybe five or seven degrees off. And I think that in the ideal world, you don't want to have just auto segmentation or just manual. You want to have both. Because something that I have learned from George is that we talk about manual segmentation being better, but that's not true because if you give it to 10 or 15 engineers, they may each come out with a slightly different outlines. With auto segmentation, you always get the same. Now, that same may be not uh, precise or accurate. So I think the robot will require 
some auto segmentation and some manual segmentation, and then on top, on top of that throw, the accuracy of the robot itself. Paul? I think your talk was fantastic. I'm going to go 9-5. I have one question. On your x-rays of the reverse, you showed with this new implant, the, the glenosphere was flush with the, uh, with, with, with the bone. Pascal Buello yesterday told us it should be two to three millimeters overhung with, uh, with an inlay. So is he right, or are you, who's smarter, you or him? Is, is this a robot question? It's my question. Yeah. No, I think, uh, I think that, that actually didn't have a perfect inferior overhand. You're correct. It should be lower on the glenosphere side. So your grade is now four out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Javier. Still better than my grade. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the next presentation. Outcome, uh, sorry, outpatient shoulder arthroplasty.